to the stars. You're the joy, 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 lighting my soul. You're the joy, 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 making me whole. Though I'm broken, I am running into your arms. Oh, the love. Whoa, 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 whoa. Beautiful singing.
Heavenly Father, God, we gather together this morning, Lord, as your children. And Lord, we long for the day when we are together in your house. Father, forever with you in heaven, Lord. And God, I just pray that you take our time of worship and just be glorified, Father. God, that you would touch each of our hearts and just help us to fall even deeper in love with you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In your name. Amen. 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 Well, our next song we've uh, we introduced a few weeks back, and we're still learning it. So if you're not familiar with it, don't feel like you're required to sing along, but make sure you try to sing along with the chorus. The chorus is a lot of fun. And the whole gist of the song is about, you know, if God can break down the walls of Jericho, he can break down anything. Any struggle in your life, any hurt, any habit, any hang up, he can take them down. You just have to give it over to him. So. sets us free. Your mighty name will ever be the soundtrack of our victory. We're lifting up your praise like a battle cry. The thunder of your name breaks us apart the night. Your matchless grace will Team.
And how many of you really appreciate our smallest worship leader? Yay, Jocelyn. <laughs> appreciate that she's able to come up and do that. Well, we're going to continue through the letters of Paul, and we're in Philippians this morning. So if you'll turn to Philippians chapter 2, we're going to look at the first 11 verses. A passage, at least part of which I believe is very familiar uh, to most of us, but very important to uh, understand the context of it. Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider your others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Amen. Well, this time we're going to dismiss our kids for their children's church time. Is Who's got it today? Oh, Shy, great. So if you can follow Shy out, all those that are uh, past the nursery stage and up to fifth grade are welcome to go for a special time teaching at their own level. My guess is they get to be a lot more active than we are. You just get to sit there. They probably get to dance around and jump and I don't know. We could, we could do a Jericho thing and walk around. We'd have to find something to walk around that needs to fall down, though. I don't know. <laughs> well, we're just slightly thin on numbers today because there were 10 of us down at Copperfield below Oxbow Dam and Hell's Canyon for the Old Farts Camp Out. And, uh, but I want you to know there were only eight members and two of us were guests, uh, Karen and myself. We were, we were the guests. We're not going to take on that mantle until we have to, okay? <laughs> well, um, again, just to review for those that uh, haven't been here, we're just looking at passages, a passage in each of uh, Paul's letters, from Romans to Philemon, um, the most significant, maybe not even the most important, but specifically the one that maybe means the most to myself or Kip as we go through, and uh, and and. Something I think that has especially affected us in our studies, in our lives, in our experience, in our past, or whatever. And so this passage in Philippians, um, to me, is, is, is the most significant passage in Philippians, I think, that is there. And I want to begin with a quote. This is, what's, this is something that Eugene Peterson wrote in 1989, so it's 30 years old. And it's in his book called The Contemplative Pastor or contemplative pastor, however you want to uh, pronounce it. Um, but he wrote these words. Actually, he spoke these words in, in an interview. American Christians too easily assume their surrounding culture is Christian. It is useful to listen to people who come into our culture from other cultures, to pay attention to what they hear and what they see. In my experience, they don't see a Christian land. If you listen to a Sultanitsan or a Bishop Tutu or university students from Africa or South America, they don't see a Christian land. They see something almost the reverse of a Christian land. They see a lot of greed and arrogance. And they see a Christian community that has almost none of the virtues of biblical Christian community, which have to do with a sacrificial life and conspicuous love. Rather, they see indulgence in feelings and emotions and an avaricious quest for gratification. Written 30 years ago, 
And I wonder if anything has changed or if it's only gotten worse. And I read that this week and I thought, that is exactly the kind of situation that Paul is addressing to the Philippians. And please, I understand Philippians was not an un unhealthy church. There was some conflict between a couple of women that seems to be one of the things that he wants to address in that letter. But overall, it seems to be a very healthy church. But again, the context is so different because they're a small church in a big empire with almost no influence and no um, notoriety. Yet Paul wants them to live as a Christian community in such a way that they begin to have an impact, that they begin to influence, and that they have the opportunity to share their experience of Jesus Christ. And so even though we are in a different time frame, and many of us have been raised with this idea that we live in a Christian culture, in a Christian America, if you've been around for the last 10 or 20 years, uh, it's probably evident that that has gone the way of the dodo bird, basically. Uh, we live in a very secular culture, and Christians still have a major share in it, a major voice in it, but it certainly is not the way it was 20, 40, 60 years ago. And so we need to hear again Paul's words on how do we be a Christian community in a non-Christian society? Uh, because what Paul's going to emphasize in this passage is so different than what our culture esteems. And it was very different than what the Roman culture of the day esteemed as well. So let's look at these 11 verses with that thought in mind. Is how do we live out a Christian community in our community, in our town? And it divides into three sections. The basis for community, the expression of community, and then the example uh, that we are to follow in creating community. And it begins in verse 1. Because the basis of community for the church is our identity in Christ. The common identity in that we are God's children. We sang just now a wonderful song. Uh, that, what, all the things that he's done for us. He's made us a part of his family. He's prepared a place for us. We are part of his family. And that's what Paul begins with. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. And again, the reality is, is this. Christ dwells in you and you dwell in Christ. It's a mutual relationship, and our identity is found in him. It's not found in our assets. It's not found in our things. It's not found in our wealth. It's not found in anything apart from Christ as the very beginning, the basis for our Christian community. It's what brings us together. It's why we are the church. We're not a service organization. We're not a, uh, a fraternity or a sorority. Uh, we're, we're, we're not... We don't come together on any other basis that we have Jesus in common. That is our encouragement with one another. And so that identity in Christ, he and us, us and him, creates a, a union amongst one another. Because we're very different people. You look around, it may not seem like it, but we all have different histories, we all have different pasts, we all have different experiences. We all have different temperaments. We all have different personalities. But because we have Jesus in common, we have something that the world doesn't experience. And we need to let that be the foundation, the basis for being a community. What else is part of that community? It says, if we have any comfort from his love, which I think believe is that we have experienced his love in so many ways, first and foremost, in forgiveness. Because we've been forgiven of our sins, because of what Jesus did on the cross, we don't live with that kind of guilt and angst and foreboding that somehow that sin is going to catch up with us and destroy us. That somehow God is going to judge us based on that sin and not upon Christ. And so there's a comfort that comes from being in his family and being in him that, that allows us to experience his love, and then it goes on from there after that forgiveness and the reestablishment of our relationship with him, uh, then, then we get the comfort of his love in his providence, what he provides for us, um, in the relationships that we establish, that we're not alone in this, in so many different ways that uh, in other 
parts of other letters. He goes into more detail, so we won't this morning. But just to realize there's a comfort that comes from being in his love. Then he says, if there is any fellowship with the Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit is so important. Because it is so easy for, we talked about this just for a moment in Sunday school this morning, it's so easy for any institution to become corrupt. The longer an institution is around, uh, the, the, the better the chances that it falls into decay and corruption. And we see this in all kinds of institutions, whether it be secular institutions like government, or whether it be spiritual institutions, even like the church. Uh, one of the things the Reformers was, were very aware of is that the church even after the Reformation, needed to be constantly reforming, constantly being made new. And that only happens through the Holy Spirit. It only happens because God is living and present both within us and among us. And so the presence and the fellowship of the Spirit is so important as well. And then he says, if there is any tenderness or compassion. And that's the caring character of, that is part of being in the Christian community, that we care for one another. Uh, th those words just express something that comes from deep within, uh, comes from not just even our hearts. Uh, it actually, technically, in Greek, it says it comes from our bowels. Now, we don't think of bowels in the same way as uh, the Greeks and Romans did, but they said that's the innermost part where the, the capacity to care and to sympathize and to empathize come from deep within us. And so it's that caring, that tenderness and compassion towards one another that is, again, is the basis for being the Christian community. All those things are found in the first verse, and they're, they're, they're framed in, in, by Paul in this if-then kind of way. But it's not an if-then that, that is assumed to be not true, but it's assumed to be true. If this is the case, and I know that it is, then do this. So Paul's not really calling them to, to change what they're doing, but to live out what they're already doing. And in verse 2, there's the then statement. If all of this stuff is true, and, and really you could say all of this stuff is the evidence of an authentic Christian life. It's the authentic Christian life in which there is identity in Christ and the experience of his love and the presence of his Holy Spirit and the caring character that, that is resulting from that. And he's assuming that that's all the case. And that's what I assume when I speak to you, when I preach to you, is that you are here because you've experienced these things, because this is the foundation of your life. And it's the basis for our gathering together. And he goes on then in verse 2 with four other things, actually six, four positive and a couple negative. What is supposed to be the expression of having this Christian foundation of community? He says, then make my joy complete, first, by being like-minded. Interesting term, like-minded, not sane-minded. Similar-minded, not perfectly conformed together. And I think that's so important. That literally means to have your mind settled. Which means that, that, again, we believe, we think the same about Jesus in ourselves and one another. F.F. F. Bruce, in his commentary, I think, put it so well and succinctly. He said, union in Christ produces unity in Christians. Union in Christ produces unity in Christians. And so we are to have a settled mind about the things that are important. And we try to do that in our, in our body. Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection is the center, most important thing in our lives. God's word and his revelation of himself is, is right up there because that's how we know the gospel. That's how we know the Christian life and how to live it out. And so there are certain foundational, central things that are absolutely crucial in a body that we have a settled mind about these things. And therefore, when we have Christ, we'll have unity. And then what does he says? Having the same love. Having love in common. And again, the, the, the assumption is that we are both the subjects and objects of love. Okay? We are the subject in, sense, in the sense that we are the lovers, but we're also the objects. We are the ones that have been loved. And that starts with God, of course, 
that he has demonstrated his love in Christ Jesus. But then it is our love that we have for him in response and then have for one another um, in all areas of life is that we, we have this common love. And then secondly, thirdly, it says, and it's a strange, I don't know why they all translate this, being one in spirit. The word is not spirit pneuma in Greek, but it's the word suke or soul in Greek. We are to be one souled. And I think that, that is such an interesting way of putting it. It's actually just one word in Greek. To, to come alongside the soul. So it's the idea of being walking together in soul. And I, I just find it interesting. And I think what it refers to, at least in our context, it seems like, have you ever had a soul friend? Somebody that you were just so close to, you had so much in common, you, you, just, you, you were just like one soul. And that's what he said should characterize the body of Christ, is that there's this one soulness, friendship. And again, real friends don't agree on everything. And it's so important to understand this, that unity does not equiv- equal uniformity. Unity does not equal uniformity. There are groups that are uniform in their thinking and sometimes even in their dress. That's not what Christ intended. He intended us to have this one soulishness, but at the same time having a diversity of, of things. We, in the church, the church of all institutions should be a place where there is discussion and debate and give and take, yet we remain friends. Yet we remain brothers and sisters in the Lord because we're not going to agree on every fine point. Those central things, Jesus, the word, those things, we have the like-minded, the settled-mindedness about that. But things on the tangents, things on the edge, things that are on the margin, we can disagree about. And that's the way that we get along as pastors in this community. That's the way we get along within the church uh, body in our, in our own church. So we are soul, we are soul shared. We are soul, have soul oneness. If the body is living out its calling. And then finally it said we have one purpose. We have a shared purpose. And again, for those of you that have been around for many years, you're aware of this. For those who haven't been around for, for that long, one of the things that I think really did that action of reforming of renewing um, our church was when we went through Rick Warren's campaign of the purpose-driven life. Because that seemed to renew and refresh many of us to what God had called us to do and what God had called us to be. And those are the kind of things that, that we need to realize continue to happen because we do have one purpose. And it's been defined historically in lots of different ways. And, and we could talk about, there's probably a whole number of things if we were to stop and just to talk about the priorities of our purpose. Um, we would probably get a whole list of things. But we know that the main ones are, is we are to love God and love our neighbor. That's how Jesus summarized it, right? We are to love God, and that means to glorify him, to worship him, to acknowledge him, to thank him all the things that we do in relationship with him. But then we are to love one another. We are to love our neighbor. We are to love that person sitting down the row from you or across the room for you. That we are to love because that is the greatest witness, to love one another. And then we could go beyond that. And we are to share uh, what God has done with us, in us, and for us. We are to have a testimony of his faithfulness in our lives and looking for opportunities to share that to let people know why we are the way we are and so there's there's lots of purposes but but that's what paul wants is that that we are all i think it may be the best way i think we're all facing and looking the same direction and going the same direction in terms of god and our spiritual lives and that is to move towards maturity to move towards completion to com- to move towards fulfillment of what God has designed for each of us. But after, in verse uh, 2, he talks about these positive things. In verse 3, he turns to the negative. Two primary things, he says. Do not act 
do nothing out of or do not act out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That word selfish ambition, the way it's translated, is simply one word. And in the Greek, it simply means rivalry. We are not competitive with one another in getting attention or getting credit or getting the glory. And I think that's what he's talking about. I've seen it, not necessarily here, but in other church systems throughout, or church uh, bodies that I've been involved with in my younger years, there did seem to be an implicit rivalry. This group versus this group. This leader versus this leader. And that has no place in the body of Christ. We're not rivals. We are brothers and sisters. We're companions. We're soul friends. And we should, in, in contrast to being rivals, we should esteem those who get honor. We should be for people getting the credit and the limelight, not being envious, not being rivals in any way. The second thing he says, besides selfish ambition, is vain conceit. Another way of putting that would be self-promotion. We're not self-promoters. We aren't, again, drawing the attention to us. We're not anything great, none of us. And we don't need the spotlight. We don't need to promote ourselves. Yet in a media culture, how is that not possible? When you look on TV, when you listen in radio, when, you, when you're, uh, especially the video, the visual component of our media culture, whether it's on the computer or on the TV, it's just so easy to be self-promoting and, and to put yourself out there in, in, in such a way that the attention goes to you rather than to God or to Jesus. So we stay away from rivalry and self-promotion, and then a little bit later he says, looking to the interests of other, looking to your own, not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. The bottom line is that we're not self-oriented. We're not selfish. We don't, we're not in it for ourselves. The, the fundamental stance of, of the body of Christ is other-centered and not self-centered. And that's what Paul is trying to say in so many words, in so many different ways, is that we don't do anything based on our own desires for our own stuff, whatever that stuff is. Then in the midst of verse 4, 3 and 4, he gives us the key. There's really one key that should characterize the community of Jesus, and that is humility. When you do nothing out of rivalry or, or self-promotion, when you act in humility, you consider others better than yourselves. Very interesting that the Christian community of the first century took over that word in the Greek. Because in the Greek, humility was not a virtue, it was a vice. It was just the opposite. Christians took that word and reformed it and reapplied it. Because in the Roman culture, it meant meanness. Meanness of spirit. And, uh, and so when we transformed it, we, we said, it, it's not being mean to yourself, but it's having a right understanding of yourself. And in that right understanding of yourself, you realize how important, how esteemed people around you are because of what Christ has done in them, and you can develop true humility. I've always loved what, how C.S. Lewis defined humility. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Isn't that important? It, so, so don't understand, this doesn't mean squashing your self-esteem. It doesn't mean not thinking yourself valuable or honorable, or, or having virtue, or, or anything about... It's, it's not about putting yourself down. It's about not even thinking about yourself, because you're busy thinking of other people, and thinking of how you can serve them, how you can encourage them, how you can love them better. So you don't think less of yourself, you think of yourself less. I think it's important in, in, in that, that whole concept that we don't, again, you're, you're not talking about squashing your self-esteem, but you're also not talk, talking about giving up self-care. 
At least that's the word that it was used when I started reading about it in the, uh, near, near the end, beginning of my ministry, is I read a whole book about self-care for pastors and ministers. And it was a, it was a phrase I'd, or a word I'd never heard before because we just didn't talk about that. I came out of, a, out of a church culture that was more about burning out for Jesus, you know, that you don't take care of yourself and, and you work yourself to the nub of your fingers working for God and his kingdom and, and you don't worry about yourself. Uh, but I remember this book saying, that is not the example that Jesus set. Jesus did the ministry, but then he took time for rest. And he took time to be with his father in prayer. And people were actually looking for him at times, wanting things from him. But he was off on the mountain, or he was out in the desert, or he was by the sea spending time with his father. And he ate, I'm sure he ate healthily. He, he did what was necessary to keep himself going. It wasn't burning out for God. It had, there was self-care aspect to this. And so that's why I think it's important to understand in verse 4, when it says, each of you should look not only to his own interests, but also to the other interests of others. It doesn't say neglect yourself and only look to the interests of others. It's a balance. You have to take care of yourself. And out of that, out of taking care of yourself, then you have the time and energy and attention that you need to look to the interests of others and to help them as, as they're needed. And so self-care is a part of this. It's not excluded in verse 4. Look to your own interests, certainly, but don't let them consume you. Don't let them dominate you so that you have no time to look to the interests of others. And, you know, one of the things that encourages me is I believe that this body has been moving towards that constantly and regularly. When we have somebody that, that, that has a need, that has a, a physical illness, that has a hospitalization, uh, whatever it might be, I constantly see you people moving towards them, standing with them, encouraging them, strengthening them, being aware of them. But just let me mention, if we don't know about it, we can't be in that position. We can't be in that role. And that has happened uh, in, infrequently where, where people suffer in silence and don't talk about the surgery that's coming up or the illness they're dealing with or, or whatever. And I think we become a lot better at that. We're much willing to, more willing to be transparent and authentic and open with those kind of things because we know that that we won't be ignored, we won't be shunned, we will be joined with, we will be come alongside of, and we will be prayed for, and we will be strengthened and encouraged to the extent it's possible from other members of the body. So I appreciate that that is, is, is again, it's a growing part of our Christian character as a body. So when we get past those first four verses, we get to this, section of verses 6 through 11. And Paul's command, and this is the example that we are to follow. So we've had the basis for a Christian community, we've had the expression of Christian community, and now we have the example of how we can live this out. And the example, of course, is Jesus. That we are to have this attitude that was the same as Jesus Christ's. And then you get into this hymn. And if you've got a, 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 an appropriate translation, they put it in the form of verse, of a poem. And most likely it was not just a poem, but it was a poem that was sung to, which is what a hymn is. A hymn is simply poetry set to music. And so it's in the, ver- it's in the form of a, of a poem. We don't know where this poem's from. It's the earliest probably one that we have, the earliest hymn that we have from the Christian church. And we don't know if Paul wrote it or collaborated with somebody else and wrote it, or if he picked it up in his travels um, in, in, the, in the churches um, that had been established out of uh, Pentecost. We just don't know. But it was obviously there, and, and he brought it into the argument of how we are to be Christian community as an example. Again, it's in the form of a verse, or a, a verse and it has two verses. Um, Verses 6 through 8 is verse 1, and verses 9 through 11 are verse 2, and they are very have very different themes and points. So when you look at it, Jesus, who being in very nature God, okay, again, there's a lot, there's been arguments for, for since the third century, well, before, from the second century on, 
about what, who was Jesus. Was he God? Was he man? Was he both? Was he, did he just look like a man? Uh, there were all these, we call it Gnosticism and Docetism, and we can find all kinds of isms that were part of the first three centuries of the church that had some explanation other than the orthodox um, explanation of who Jesus was. But this is one of those areas that, that, that's pretty clear. Jesus was in very nature God. But he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. The gist of that is that Jesus, though he knew who he was, did not assert the rights that came with that. He did not assert himself. He was not self-promoting. He was uh, not self-oriented. He was directed to others, even though he didn't have to be. Even though his position as being God, he did not have to humble himself or make himself nothing. So the first thing is that there's no self-assertion for Jesus. And again, remember, always keep in mind, this is our example. So we are not self-serving, we're not self-asserting, or we're not, in, we're not intended to be in following his example. And then notice there's three humblings that it says about Jesus. First of all, he made himself a human being after being God. I don't think we can understand that that's probably the most significant of the three humblings, that he humbled himself to become a man. Secondly, he humbled himself, it says, that being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, or excuse me, verse 7, that taking, made himself nothing, coming from God to a man, made himself a servant in human likeness. So not only did he make himself human, but he made himself a servant, a slave, the lowest of the low. And then the third one, of course, is found in, a, in verse 8. He humbled himself and became obedient to death so that he died as a sacrifice. So the three humblings, he became human, he became a servant, he became a sacrifice. Jesus' example is that we are to do something similar. Because we don't assert ourselves. And this is always the danger. When we begin to sing the things that I am a child of God, I'm a part of the family of God, good for me. And you know what? That entitles me to certain things, right? That's the danger, is that, that when we find ourselves in that position of being God's children, that somehow we become entitled. And we begin to start to live like we're entitled. As if our needs are preeminent, as if we should get whatever we want. And that's not the case. That's why I think G Paul puts this in here. We follow Jesus' example. Even though he was an absolute authority and position, he was not entitled. He took voluntarily the form of a man, the, stat the position of a servant, and as, as a sacrifice. So, we have to understand that. That's our example. But then here's the, and this is, this is really strange to me, because I've seldom heard it, but it's there. When Paul gives us this example, he gives us two verses, and he doesn't leave us with just the first verse, verses 6 through 8, about being humbled, um, being, having humility, self-sacrifice. He goes on and talks about that Christ was then exalted, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And we're very familiar because it's become part of songs and it's part of our tradition. That what follows his humbling is glory. After the cross was the glory of resurrection. The glory of sitting at the right hand of the Father. The glory that he will judge the nations. And it's something that we don't like to talk about because the, the, I think the parallels continue into that second verse for us. That there is going to be a glory awaiting for us that we can't even begin to imagine. It's not going to be the same as Jesus's, but Jesus is going to share it with us. And this is what we generally think of, the way theologians think about the Christian life, is it goes through three phases. It begins with justification, that is, we come into new life and a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and we have a spiritual life, and that's called justification, what God did for us in Jesus. And then you have sanctification, and that lasts our whole life. And that's 
how we become more and more conformed to Jesus' life and Jesus' image in our lives is there's this process of sanctification. But then the third form is glorification. The third phase, I should say. The third phase is glorification. And we don't talk about that much because most likely we don't know that much about it. But there are hints in it because Paul tells the, the Romans that we are being changed from glory to glory. And again, C.S. Lewis wrote about it um, in the weight of glory, that there's a glory that's coming that Jesus is going to, in some sense, share. And he even promised his disciples that, that they would help him rule over the people of Israel. That there is some kind of ruling, some kind of caregiving, some kind of tending the garden, whatever it might be, we don't know what it is, but it's coming. That the humbleness, the humility, and so forth is not an end in itself, but leads us to glory. Just as Jesus despite the shame of the cross, anticipated the glory, the joy, the benefits, the status, whatever it was that was going to wait for him after the cross, he was willing to go to the cross. And I think the same thing is our example. As we sacrifice for others, as we look to the interests of others, as we live out and give and, and love and so forth, it's great, but it's not an end in itself because God has plans for us that we can't even, didn't Paul say it? No eye is seen, no ear is heard. What God has in store, what God has in plan for those who love him. And so there's a glory that's going to be ours as well when we follow Jesus' example. I started with Eugene Peterson quote. He's a writer and a pastor from another generation. But I wanted to read one from a present-day pastor, uh, David Platt wrote the book Radical. He's a pastor of a Bible church in McLean, Virginia, just outside of the seat of power of D.C. And he writes about going to uh, another country. And I'm not sure, he doesn't say where, if it's Asia or South America or Africa. But he talks about going there and going to a small house church that sat up on a hill that was a two-hour walk for most everybody to go to, that wanted to go to it. And it was just a small group of people who would come, and he describes the, the fellowship and the, the worship and the scripture that's shared. And then he writes these words. American Christians too, excuse me, it's surprisingly simple when you think about it, he writes. Not easy, but simple. This church has so little of the things you and I think about when it comes to church in our culture. They don't have a nice building. They don't have a great band. They don't have a charismatic preacher. They don't have any programs. They just have each other. God's word in front of them and God's spirit among them. And apparently that's enough. I wonder if that would be enough for us. I wonder if that would be enough for me. Would you and I be content with belonging to a community that is simply committed to seeking God loving each other, and sharing the good news of God's love with the world around us, no matter what it costs us. Isn't this the essence of the church according to God's design? And I think it's a great observation. We have so much, and we want things just right, and we want things done our way sometimes. What if it was all taken away, and you had to come meet in my basement? And you had nothing in terms of banners or videos or instruments. All you had was God's word, people in God's family, and the purpose for life. Would that be enough? You know, my hope is that it would be for many of us. God hasn't put us in that position. He's put us in Weezer, Idaho in the 21st century. It's different than somebody living in Cambodia or Thailand or Iran, or Syria, where death is a constant threat, where persecution is ongoing, whatever it might be. Yet, I think what Paul describes in the Philippians is the intention that God has for his body, no matter where they are, what time period, is that we are to have that, that community, no matter what it costs, no matter what efforts that we have to make to be a part of it, it's what changes the world. Let's pray. 
Lord, again, your word um, is convicting when we fall short. Yet, Lord, you know who we are. You know what motivates us. You know our hearts. There's nothing hidden from you. Lord, give us these kind of simple hearts that simply desire you, your word, and your people. Lord, just confident that you are, at work among, you are at work among us, that your Holy Spirit dwells here, and that you have a future for us. Lord, help us to be faithful, loving brothers and sisters in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. This song is, uh, is an old familiar one I'm sure most of you have heard and know. And uh, I love the words, uh, make me a servant humble and meek. Help me to lift up those who are weak. And it's a request, um, it's a prayer to make us more like Jesus. And that's what it really comes down to in a lot of ways. We just want to be more like Jesus. So let's sing together. I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you.
my song to rise to you when temptation comes my forward with this morning's offering, please. I want to tell you something important. God doesn't need your money. <laughs> but he wants you to be generous because he cares about your character. That's why we give.
Now the days and hours and moments of our suffering seem so long, and the toilsome wait and wandering threaten silence to our song. Now our pain is real and pressing, where our faith is. Savior's victory song. 